Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the Politics and Media Show with me, Salma Yaqub. The growth of the far right across Europe is of particular concern to Muslim minorities, not least here in the UK. The English Defence League has become an increasing force in often violent protests. In Europe, far-right parties have fared increasingly well in elections, establishing footholds in Parliament and sometimes even a voice in government. But their support often reaches beyond the formal membership of political parties and is found on the internet. A major new study has shed light on the online social media arena. The study by the think tank Demos has revealed how the online social media following for many of these parties consists of tens of thousands of sympathisers and supporters. The report entitled New Face of Digital Populism calls on mainstream politicians to respond to and address concerns over immigration and cultural identity without succumbing to xenophobic or racist solutions. Before I introduce this week's guests, let's take a quick look at the report on the far right in Europe. Just over three months ago, Anders Breivik went on a deadly rampage, killing dozens of innocent children in Norway. Breivik was motivated by extreme anti-establishment and anti-Islamic views. His actions immediately focused international attention on Europe's far right, even though its political parties distanced themselves from his actions. In recent years, political parties associated with the far right have seen their influence grow steadily. Many now have an established presence, while some even have a voice in government. The support is often based on anti-Islamic ideas. Now, a new study has shed light on a previously less well-known part of the far-right support, the online arena. The report by Demos reveals a Europe-wide spread of hardline nationalist sentiments, mainly among young men. The British think tank gathered questionnaire responses from over 10,000 users of Facebook from 14 parties in 11 countries. Their report found a deep cynicism among young men towards their governments and a fear of an eroding cultural identity, with immigration and the spread of Islam of particular concern. One of the report's authors, Jamie Bartlett, said it was vital to track the attitudes of the emerging online generation of far-right supporters, which he believes now numbers hundreds of thousands. And just like Anders Breivik was, the writer says they're disillusioned with mainstream politics. He says politicians across Europe need to listen and respond. Some, like one European MEP, believe Europe is at a crossroads in its history, which in years to come will either see a fight back against xenophobia and Islamophobia, or an increase in support for hatred and division in society. I'm pleased that one of the co-authors of the Demos report, Jamie Bartlett, is with us in the studio today. Welcome, thank Hello. you for being here. We're also joined by Talha Ahmed, who is on the, member, uh, on the membership committee of the Muslim Council of Britain, the UK's largest umbrella Muslim organisation. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. And on the line we have with us Patrick Sukdio, who is the international director of the Barnabas Fund, which provides aid for persecuted Christian minorities. He's also author of numerous books on Islam and Christianity. Thank you so much, Patrick, for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Sadly, I can't be with you as I've just uh, come back from overseas, but it's a privilege to be on Islamic, this Islam channel. Thank you. If I can first just turn to Jamie. Uh, this program is focusing on the Demos report. How would you summarize your findings? You tracked these people who, online, asked them themselves, so it's not about you trying to mind read, mm -hmm. finding out what actually motivates them and what, what did you actually find? Well, the report's really looking into this enormous supporter base online. I mean, the, we're, everybody's talking about the rise of these, you call them far-right parties, maybe new right or populist right is a more accurate term. Um, we're worried about the formal membership of these groups. How, you know, how popular are they? What are their members concerned about? But actually, alongside the formal official membership, there are thousands more that are sympathisers on Facebook. Social media for many young people is the way that they engage politically today. So we just wanted to try to understand who those people are because they are also well, the voters of the present and the generation of the future who are going to make up the support of these parties in the, in the years ahead. Um, so by collecting data on 10,000 of them, which was quite a large number of surprising for us actually how many responded, what we found was 
the, the real support base for us, the real concerns that people were raising was not about economics, and a lot of people think that this is just an economic movement. You know, people are worried about the way that immigrants are coming in and stealing their homes and their jobs and all the rest of it. It was Actually, a factor in the research. It's a, it's a, it's a, you're it's saying it's not the most immigration, is a, immigration was an enormous factor, but, the, the, but it was really about the threat that immigration, but also economic globalisation more generally, is, is having on national identity and national culture. You know, di combine that with a, a very significant disillusionment with mainstream politicians, and I think you're getting closer to understanding what motivates the supporters of these parties. I don't think they should all be labelled as neo-Nazis or far-right extremists, because many of these concerns are quite legitimate. And I think which, which of those would you consider legitimate? Because some of them may well be things which are just fanned by the media. People saying there's a problem where well, there isn't one yeah. and it's quite noticeable that, uh, f for example in Britain where you see the rise of the BNP uh, and other uh, far-right parties, many people would call them far-right, is often in areas which are next to areas where there's, there's lots of immigration. Uh, noticeably in areas of large immigration people tend to get on. It's perception. So it, yeah, is that, it the reality or is yeah, it perception? That's interesting. That's, that's called neighbourhood theory, which is you're, you're basically worried about your t town turning into the town next door and the belief that, you know, your, your town is about to be radically transformed. It's actually not that dissimilar across Europe. We, we find quite similar results. Um, and then that would go about on, on unfounded fear because if uh, people actually live in those uh, other neighbourhoods are getting on. Uh, absolutely. But it's the absolutely. people who don't have that direct contact then base the information on more stereotypical information rather than a reality. So my question to you is, is this fear based on a reality or is it perception and then who is then responsible for I that think perception? That I, think it's, I think it's both because it depends on the people involved. I mean, we had many responses from people who would document their personal experiences of how they've been treated badly by the government, by the local government, how they personally feel like their jobs have been taken by immigrants that are undeserving, that there are immigrant gangs roaming their streets and they're worried and nervous about it. Now the reality is that you've got to, in any political establishment, you've got to allow people to air those grievances because some of them are legitimate concerns. But what you do have I think. And you is don't a, think that people are airing them? The Daily well, Express on a daily basis airs it. Yeah, yeah. So that, does the Daily Mail. Yeah, well, I was just getting to that because I think that's an interesting point. Because for many of them, there is a sense that Western civilization is on a precipice. It's about to be sucked into the abyss, mm. um, mainly through the forces of Islam that's going to take over with sort of Eurabia theory that the population of Europe is going to be overwhelmingly Muslim within two generations and that Western civilization and Western freedoms and values are under attack. Now, the reality is, of course, that they're absolutely not. Uh, and I think that's what's interesting, because it can be easier to understand these groups when you realize that a lot of the media they consume, yeah. which is both from mainstream media uh, and from social media sites, keep reinforcing this view. Well, I could, and so I could when, come uh, back to that, because we've got Patrick on the line, who actually writes on these kinds of matters, and perhaps with some sympathy to the view that there is a real problem of Muslims in Europe which feeds into these ideas. Patrick, what would be your comment on that? I think I'd want to start off by giving my own experience. My family and I came to the UK in the late 1950s. My brother and I were the only two Asian boys in a school. We were often beaten up. In the 1960s, I lived through uh, the effects of Powell's speech, his rivers of blood, and saw the effect it had on dockers. Mm -hmm. I lived in East London, and I remember going to work in winter, having to go from streetlight to streetlight. It was so dangerous. But do you put that down to Enoch Powell's words, uh, his uh, rhetoric impacting on other people? He might not have known you personally, it, so it, would you say then words matter? Let, let me just go on. In the 1990s, I lived through the effects of the then National Front, where I was personally beaten up by them. So I lived through, you could say, three great waves of anti-immigrant, not just rhetoric, but, but violence. I lived through what I saw was the rise of a new neo-Nazi movement within the UK and within Europe. And I am very concerned at the rise of... Uh, the neo-Nazi movements. The report does uh, suggest something of 
a, a difficulty in defining movements, particularly when they're combined, both the left and the right. Mm. I would agree with you, words do uh, affect people on the ground, and I'm concerned about the use of social media and how it can be manipulated to further racist attitudes. I think the difficulty which we're in is if we take Britain and Europe, it is undergoing enormous uh, turmoil. We have had in the past few years the failure of our politicians in terms of their ethical and moral standards, the failure of the media, the failure of the bankers, mm. uh, the, you, know, you name it. And we've had those failures. At the same time, when we come to look at religion, in particular Christianity, it's also undergoing major crisis. It has been vilified and attacked by Europe, which is not just secular, but secular humanist also. So I think we are living in a context without a moral and spiritual rudder, so to speak. And that is leading to the rise of extremism. I think we must distinguish between any valid criticism of a religion or an idea or an ideal which seeks to impose itself on society and people, individuals. I think people and individuals must be protected. And I personally am thankful that successive governments of all political persuasions have recognized the need to move away from racist rhetoric and ideology and to pass laws that truly do protect people and their fundamental freedoms. Well, thank you for your summary there. If I can turn to Thalha, you're part of Muslim Council of Britain, representing many, many Muslims. Is there a real fear among the Muslim community around these issues? Uh, um, how, how is the community engaging positively, or is it just on the defensive at the moment? <clears throat> well, um, I think the rise of um, Islamophobia and the rise of you know, far right is certainly a major concern. And we know the report after report suggests that it is on the rise. Um, I accept that James pointed that not all of them are fanatic, hatred, uh, fascists that we uh, w w some some would like us to believe. But a large number of them are. And in fact, what we know is that through active involvement within these groups, many of them do. Uh, become uh, quite violent um, and quite hateful. Uh, so it is a major concern um, and I think it, it's a welcome move in the sense that Demos highlights this which will hopefully make it a, an even bigger of an issue and our politicians will start taking notice of it. Um, there's two issues, whether how Muslim um, responds to it. Um, yeah, at the grassroots level I think the response varies uh, from place to place but um, as you will be more aware than anybody else uh, Muslim community has increasingly are becoming active and keen on engaging within the wider society uh, in a way which which is quite phenomenal uh, in the sense that they are trying to engage with, with other you know, faith groups, non-faith groups and civil society organizations in order to show, in order to dem demonstrate um, you know the, uh, what exactly they belong to and what exactly you know they represent. Um, mm. Essentially, addressing this fear factor, the uh, unknown, because many people are afraid of Islam or Muslims because of what they hear in the media. Sure. If I can come back, Jamie, I take your point that it's important to understand and be nuanced about it, uh, just as many Muslims um, don't like the fact that everybody's lumped together mm. um, or when a terrorist atrocity takes place suddenly uh, people are demonized as a community in the same way uh, but at the same time recognize there may be genuine grievances and for example many many people don't like the idea of the foreign policy that's going on and so it should not be used to shut down legitimate debate and legitimate grievances, and you're pointing out in, in your report, there are some legitimate grievances, a minority will express them in a way which is not acceptable, but it doesn't mean there aren't legitimate grievances. So how would you summarise what you feel the legitimate grievances are, which perhaps some extremists are exploiting? Uh, I mean, legitimate grievances to me just simply mean that in a democracy, people should be allowed to air whatever concerns they have uh, provided that they're not impinging